Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Jesus Fellowship. It's good to see everyone this morning. How are we doing? Good to see you all. Welcome joining. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us online. We are glad that you have tuned in this morning. We have a great morning planned. Uh, just a few quick things that we're going to be getting to. Pastor Mike will be preaching again from John as we're continuing to go through that book. We are excited about that. Uh, we do not have kids ministry, but I just want to thank the teachers and those who worked hard last week. We've been having a great, great show when we've been having the kids do their kids uh, environments. So big hand to those guys for doing that. We're going to continue to push that and make sure that we can get our kids uh, together. So we're going to look forward to more news on that. And then at the end of the service today, we not only have communion that we will be partaking in, but we're also going to have some fellowship after. So if you did not see uh, on the social medias, on the Facebooks and everything, um, nothing big and extravagant. We're just going to meet if it's nice. Uh, it looks like we're probably going to be inside. Um, we're going to just have some apple cider and some hot chocolate for you guys. We encourage you to just come out to the Welcome Center or out on the patio. Grab a drink for a couple minutes and just fellowship with some people uh, that you haven't seen in a while and have some time to, uh, to talk and to chat and to fellowship. We're going to have that for you immediately following the service. So a lot of good stuff to get to. This morning we're going to kick it off with some worship, though, and I wanted to open up reading a scripture out of the book of Revelation. So as we prepare for worship this morning and we prepare to sing, Let's just open our hearts to God's word. Uh, Revelation can be a weird book, so let's just uh, remember that basically at its core, it is just a book that is talking about Jesus, and that's what this passage is about. So together, I'm going to read in chapter 5 of Revelation, starting in verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Let's stand together and sing as Jess leads us through this song. Creation, I sing praise to 
the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation, I sing. To the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. in all his majesty and all his glory left his throne and came to the earth to take on human form and to give of himself to take on the sins of man the sins of this broken world that we broke and to do away with them to wash us clean he came from his glory to this earth Let's sing of that. Let's sing of the sacrifice of the worthy lamb, the king. Come on. You can. You came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hands. Sing of his love, church. No, your love bled for me. Oh, your blood in crimson streams. Oh, your death is hell's defeat. A cross meant to kill is my victory. Oh, this amazing grace. Oh, your amazing grace. I've seen and tasted it. It's running through my veins. I can't escape its grip. In you, my soul is safe. You cover everything. Oh, 
your love bled for me. Oh, your love in crimson streams. Oh, your death is hell's defeat. A cross meant to kill is my victory. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, who takes away our sin. The Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again makes us alive again behold the lamb of god who takes away our sin who takes away our sin the holy lamb of god makes us alive again makes us alive again your love oh your love bled for me oh your blood in crimson streams oh your death is hell's defeat oh cross man to kill is my victory oh a cross man to kill is my victory yeah that's all right yeah you can clap Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin and makes us alive again. As we close this moment of worship, let's sing in joy and celebration of hearts that have been awakened, hearts that have been made alive. Let's sing this out, church. Your love. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Yeah. Here we go. There were walls between us, by the cross you came and broke them down, broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called, you called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Here we go. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Yeah. All right, verse two. Feel, Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life, back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive. Yeah. Cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. 
sing of the love we have found. Here we go. Oh, what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive because you're alive. What a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive because you're alive. Here we go. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we worship you for your amazing love, which has awakened hearts. By the power of your gospel, it has awakened hearts to life. And it is that that we celebrate. It is your gospel that we celebrate, and it is you that we worship. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. You came, you died, you were the lamb that was slain. We worship you, and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, guys. Go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you for singing with us. Good morning, everybody. We are going to kind of jump right into our message today. So if you have your Bible, please open up to John chapter 1. If you are using one of the black hardback ones, it'll be page 677 or thereabouts. We are going to be dealing with John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And we have come to one of the most iconic moments here in the biblical narrative when John the Baptist utters his line, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And the instrumental impact of that upon his audience and upon the original uh, community that would have heard that line is of the utmost uh, Importance. Like, I was trying to think of an illustration to compare, like, something of that radical nature to what we would really gather, gather today, and I, I really couldn't come up with a good illustration. So I'm, you know, never claimed to be a good illustrator, so I'm not going to attempt to illustrate it and have it fall short of the impact. Let's just go and we'll do a little bit of biblical history to explain where John is gathering this term and creating this term, and then we'll hopefully let the scriptures bring their impact Upon us, We tend to minimize and overlook this passage and the significance of those words, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We tend to minimize that because we're not familiar with the Old Testament. And, I'm sorry, I'm very, very thirsty today. We tend to not have a, a firm grasp of the Old Testament, so we do want to spend some time in the Old Testament today uh, breaking this out and understanding the, the language of sacrifice that John is going to be uh, utilizing here. Uh, but our main point, and, and if you want to throw that slide up behind me, main point, is that Jesus, as the Lamb, offers himself as the perfect atoning sacrifice to perfectly save every person who will believe. This is the essential takeaway. This is the point that John the Baptist is making in this passage. 
And as we move from uh, a time of song to the word, to taking of the Lord's table today, this is the utmost important thing you must have in mind as you prepare to take of the table. The table represents the finished work of Christ. What is that work? It is Jesus as the sacrificial lamb offering himself to make a perfect atonement for you who believe. We've got to, I mean, and, and, and we're going to move into how this brings assurance and how it should inform your assurance as a believer, your confident hope of the loving uh, God who saved you. We need to uh, frame that in this way. But let's dive into here, John chapter 1, and let's just get going. John chapter 1, starting in verse 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we come today to one of the most critical portions of your word in which we learn that Jesus is that sacrificial lamb. He is the true and greater Passover. He is the fulfillment of the day of atonement. He is the only means by which we are cleansed from sin and by which wrath is satisfied in your sight. And you have gifted this not only to your people, the Israelites, but you have gifted this to the nations. As our opening call to worship scripture spoke of, you have ransomed people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And we will sing your praise endlessly for all of eternity. But as we still are in the temporal, and as we prepare to take of the table, Father, I pray that the impact of this passage, your word would go forth, and your spirit would produce a faith and a trust and a hope and a reliance solely on the work of Christ. That we would cast aside the hopes of our idols, we would cast aside uh, the self-righteousness of our own efforts, and we would look to Christ and Christ crucified. That we may glorify our Savior. And it's for His glory and fame we pray. Amen. So, I really want to hammer one verse today. That's it, verse 29. Um, but if we don't do verses 30 and 34, we kind of lose the whole narrative chunk. So real quick, we're going to summarize verses 30 through 34 as John's affirmation of all the testimony that we've been building of over the, over the weeks, of, of who the Word is, who the Word made flesh is, all that that encompasses in the fact that the Word is eternal. He is uncreated. He is the creator of all that is. He is unchanging. And he was before John was. With regards to his human nature, he came after John. And again, I know that's a lot, and that's like six weeks right there. But we're just summarizing. It's cool. Work with me. And then we're going to take a deep dive back into the Old Testament for that one verse. But in these verses, John's words serve to reassure and reaffirm the identity of the one he came to declare. That was John's whole job. His job is done. Like, it's, he's over. He gets to retire into the sunset of prison and having his head cut off for preaching holiness and righteousness. That's that's his deal, right? But right now, his job has been to proclaim the one who would come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about how all of that ties into Old Testament prophecy about how the the one would come who would cleanse the people of God. He would wash away their iniquities and their idolatries and their sins. He would put a new heart and he would put a new spirit. That's that baptism. 
Okay, we are baptized by one spirit into one body, and it is by Jesus Christ. John is the water baptizer. Jesus is the spirit baptizer. And it is only through Jesus and his baptism by the Holy Spirit that we are brought into that family of God, into that people of God. It is through Christ and by Christ and for Christ that we are saved. Okay? It's John's whole job. He describes him as the one who came before me. He is eternal. He comes as the fulfillment of the Baptist, John the Baptist, divine mission. This is in fulfillment of Scripture. It is in fulfillment of promise. Jesus had the Spirit descend upon him to anoint him, to, to bless him for this mission that he was about to accomplish. And he himself, Jesus, will baptize others with the Spirit for the new birth because he alone is the Son of God. Only the Son of God could fulfill all that was necessary for the Lamb of God in order to effect and to accomplish a redemption for his people. It is not the mere blood of goats and bulls and sheep and turtle doves, the continuous sacrifice of the insufficient animal. That is merely an object lesson. It does not actually accomplish redemption, as the author of Hebrews tells us. But the perfect, spotless blood of the Lamb of God, the Son of God, God himself had to satisfy the penalty, and God himself could offer blood that was actually able to cleanse from sin. Okay? So let's dive here into verse 29. I want to remind you of our main point. Jesus, as the Lamb, offers himself as the perfect atoning sacrifice to save every person who will believe. We look at John chapter, 29, or chapter 1, verse 29, and there's this line, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We need to break down three things today. This is our, uh, our goal. First thing we're going to break down is the language of the sacrificial Lamb of God. Because fun fact, John the Baptist invented this term, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was his. Inspired by the Spirit of God, certainly, but this was his language. We want to know where did he get it, okay? We also, number two, want to break down the nature of the atonement. What does that mean? Okay, because if you don't understand the atonement, you will not truly understand what Christ did. Now I realize that that's a hefty, weighty subject. We spent four weeks on a Wednesday night breaking down the atonement. We've got 40 minutes. So you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. You're going to have to get biblical with me, and we're going to do our best here. But I think we can do it. And the third and final point that we're going to break down is the application of atonement for assurance. It's great to know the doctrine of the atonement. It's great to understand what Christ did. But what does that do for you personally as a believer? That's what we want to work on today. So let's start with breaking down the sacrificial language. If you guys remember, from several weeks ago, we talked about John, the Baptist, is the son of Zechariah, the priest. Okay, he's, a, he's in the priestly family. This is his family's business, to, to offer sacrifices, to put forth incense, to work in the temple. He is intimately familiar with the language of the sacrificial system of Israel. He is intimately aware of the high holy days of Jewish faith, the Passover. Or Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that's another sacrifice. He knows these things. So he is drawing upon that knowledge when the Spirit points to him, Jesus, the Lamb of God, referencing the Passover, who takes away the sins of the world, referencing the Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement sacrifices. And he's going to weave these into this statement. And everybody who's aware, everybody who's listening to him, his disciples, those around him, they're going to instantly know what he means and the significance and the weight of the fact that he did not say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of Israel. Okay, we've been building this point for weeks, and hopefully today is going to drive it home. He does not say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of Israel. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And again, we've referenced already that Greek word cosmos can be translated as nations. And it's the significance of what was once only the prerogative of Israel as God's people is going to be proclaimed and made and offered as a sacrifice 
for Jew and Gentile alike. He has opened the doors, as it were. He has, he has, he has left the, 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 the sacrificial blood pour out on not just Israel, not just the biological sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the unclean ones. And when I say unclean, obviously this is in heavy air quotes, right? Because as John just said to the, the Israelites who came out last week when we talked about it, you're all unclean. You're all in need of washing. You're all in need of the baptism that I bring that points to the one who's coming later. But let's turn to Exodus chapter 12. I am reading, by the way, from the ESV. I realize the Pew Bibles are in New, uh, New King James. It should be pretty similar. It will be behind me otherwise if you need it. Let's start here, Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. This is Moses speaking on behalf of God to the children of Israel while they are still in slavery in Egypt. He's about to institute the Passover. And that, if you guys know your biblical Old Testament history, is the night on which they sacrificed the lamb, took its blood, smeared it on the doorposts and on the lintel of their house in faith that as this blood was spread across their house, that the, the destroyer, the angel, would not pass through their house when he was killing the firstborn of Egypt. No blood, your firstborn dies. Blood, you're safe. Okay? And this is a foreshadow typifying what Christ's blood will accomplish, the passing over of judgment. We're going to define that later, not yet, but the word is propitiation. You're getting the full church word experience today. You're going to get a lot of terms. That's why I made slides today. But it is a propitiation. Oh, thanks, Hannah. It is a propitiation or a passing over of judgment. Let's read here in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. That's the essential message that they put their faith in. We don't have to have strong faith. We don't have to have perfect, unwavering faith. We merely have to trust God at his word that if this blood is present, then we will be safe. Judgment will not come to this house. My firstborn will not die. We will be saved. That's it. Okay? Now Moses continues on in verse 21 through 23 as he's explaining the ritual, the element of what they're going to do to the people of Israel. Verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel, which is above the door, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Now, if you can picture in your imagination, I'm not the first to come up with this, but the lintel being on the top, and the two doorposts, you draw lines between them, and you get a cross. Okay, again, the, the Israelites at this point in history did not know a man named Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was going to hang on a cross for sin. All they're operating on is the word of God that says, put this blood on your doorpost. It will be a sign to avert, to remove judgment and justice from coming to you. Because his purpose was coming through the land of Egypt to destroy the Egyptians. To kill, to execute justice for all their crimes, all their sins, all their violence against his people. But if the Israelites did not operate in faith and put this blood on their doorpost, they're just as guilty as the Egyptians, they will die as well. And here we see the great picture being put before us of, yes, Egypt was sinful and wicked, so was Israel. Egypt deserved death. They deserved the destroyer to come through and kill them. Yes, so did Israel. What separates them? The blood of the Passover lamb. Both parties are equally guilty. Both parties should equally die. But this is an atonement. This is the, man, you are good, girl. You're right on time. This is the atonement. This is the, the reconciliation of these parties. And again, we're going to be popping these terms up left and right. 
But what happens here, though, is this gets instituted as a national feast for Israel. This is something they're going to do every year. Every single year, they're going to have the Passover lamb. They're going to celebrate it. Not every year is, is Egyptians dying. Right? That was once judgment fell. The Israelites were rescued. But as a perpetual memorial to them and their children, they will celebrate this feast day. Moses writes about this in verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you, and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. When God institutes this, he institutes a distinction. Only my people... Only those who bear the mark of the covenant with Abraham's circumcision, only those who are Israelites will partake of this feast. It was a death penalty crime for a non-Israelite to attempt to take part in the Passover. Why? Because God is drawing a distinction. Only my people, whom I have called out of sin and called out of death and called out of darkness, have the privilege of partaking of this meal, of this sacrifice, of this holy day. And the question that comes before in in, in this context is if you want to partake of it, you want to be part of the people of God, you have to come to God on his own terms. Males, it's going to cost you something. Ladies, you get in there a little bit easier. But that's, you know, we're talking about a, a historical event and, 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 and the, the point is, though, that you can come to God on God's terms, but only on God's terms. And again, this Passover lamb pictured and taught generations of Israelites that judgment comes your way because of your sin. However, God has made a way for judgment to be averted. God has made a way for a substitute, a substitutionary lamb to take your place, to take the judgment, to take the wrath. Oh, Israel, look to the Passover lamb, which is why then John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God. He's drawing a direct parallel back to the Passover lamb. But that's not the only parallel he's drawing. He also draws a parallel to the Day of Atonement, which is Leviticus chapter 16. That is the next book after Exodus. It will also be behind me. Leviticus chapter 16 in verses 21 and 22. Let me set this up first. Because again, I wish we had time to read all of Exodus chapter 12 and all of Leviticus 16, but we don't. And there's lots of just blood and death and gore, and most of you don't actually like to hear about that. So we'll summarize. On the Day of Atonement, which was in the fall, it was actually around this time. Uh, Passover takes place in the spring, Yom Kippur takes place in the fall time. The entire congregation of Israel would come together at the tabernacle or the temple, wherever they were worshiping at this point in history. And the high priest, whose job was this one day a year job, you want to talk about an easy gig, he works one day a year. The thing is, though, is his working one day a year may cost him his life. If he does not follow to the T God's prescription for offering this particular sacrifice. He is commanded, the high priest is commanded to come and do this extensive washing ritual, again signifying his own sinful nature. He is to make a series of sacrifices for his own sin and for his family's sin so that he may be considered ritually clean and ritually pure because On this one day of the year, he is going to cross between the veil of the holy place and the most holy place. And the reason it's called the most holy place, is separate from the holy place, is because while the holy place is made clean with all these offerings and sacrifices, the most holy place contains the tangible presence of God. And for that which is sinful to enter into the presence of that which is holy, 
is death. Okay? Got to understand the weight of this and the seriousness of this guy. As he's just made all the offerings, he's washed himself, he's got his linen clothes on, he's clean, and he's about to take a bowl of blood beyond this curtain, and he knows because he's heard the stories of what happened when the wrong sacrifice was offered, and, and generations before him, several high priests were incinerated alive for not doing it the right way. you got to imagine, in his mind, he's like, I really hope this whole heifer thing works. I mean, I'm only like 33. I want, to, I want to live to see my kids. I hope this heifer actually does what my father told me it would do. Because I'm about to enter into the veil. And in fact, in this veil is the smoke of the incense is already burning to shield me even after being made clean from seeing the presence of God. Because if anyone sees the presence of God, they will die. He probably takes a deep breath. And he pushes past that curtain, and he's probably got his eyes closed, and he's just flinging blood on the altar, because he's like, if I do this wrong, I die. If I don't do this right, everybody outside dies. This is of the utmost importance. And as he does this ritual, he is cleansing, the passage says, he's cleansing the, uh, the tabernacle, he's cleansing the people, he's cleansing the tent of meeting, he's making this atonement, and then he's going to go out and he's going to take these two goats, one goat, they're going to they're gonna cast lots for it. And the lot that falls on the one goat means that he dies. He is sacrificed. He is, blood is shed on the altar. And we see, again, that propitiation element of the wrath comes down and kills this lamb or this goat, as it were. The other goat, however, is known as a scapegoat. You guys may know that term. That's where the, the biblical term, right? Scapegoat. So he would take the scapegoat. And he would put his hands on this animal's head. And he would confess the sins of the nation. I don't know how long that takes, but I imagine it's either a really quick generic, Lord, we are wicked and deserving of your judgment, or he might spend some time. He's like, well, I know Sister Susan over here did this, so I'm going to definitely impute that one because I know about that. But anyway, what he would do is he would lay his hands upon this animal. And in faith, he would impute or count or credit the sins of the nation of Israel upon this animal, and then they would pick some guy, and he would drive that goat out from the camp. He's chasing it, he's beating it, he's sending it out in the wilderness. And the, the understanding was, is once the sins of Israel were imputed or placed upon this animal, it had to be driven from the camp. And if that thing comes back, so does the sins of Israel. So you know that guy whose lot fell on him to cast that goat out, he's taking that thing far. Because you don't want to be the one guy that screws up the entire atonement and then everybody dies. They will never let you live that one down, right? So the sins are imputed and driven from the people of God, and this other goat suffers the wrath of death. And thus, atonement is secured for the people of Israel. Now, that's a big summary. I'm going to read you a few quick passages out of this, starting here in verse 21. And Aaron, who was the high priest at this point in time in the book of Leviticus, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area and shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. I also want to direct you to verse 30 as a summary statement. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. So this sacrifice that uh, John is alluding to, this day of atonement sacrifice, actually contains two elements. And this is how we're going to break down. So we broke down the sacrificial language, right? The Passover lamb, the day of atonement, the Yom Kippur sacrifices. This is where John is getting it. But we want to break down this language. Now, this is actually where I kept the slides for this purpose. So, the Passover demonstrates propitiation. It is the appeasing or the satisfying of wrath through sacrifice. 
Now, some people don't like to hear about God's wrath. They don't like to hear about God's justice, his judgment, his anger. But the fact remains that because sin, because evil, because of wickedness is a corruption of all that is good and a danger to all that is good, God cannot stand it. He hates it. He is angry against it. Now, we're all like, oh, yeah, that's great. Until you realize that you fall into that camp. And then we're like, no, we don't like that anymore, Lord. Can you change your standard? And God says, I am unchangingly perfect. I will change my standard for no man. And then you're like, well, this puts us in a little bit of a tight spot. And then we remember that God has graciously made a propitiation for his people. A sacrifice can be offered. A substitute can be placed in the part of the guilty party. And that entity, that animal, or in the case of Jesus, suffers the cost, the anger, the judgment, the justice of the guilty party. Death. Now, let me back up for just a quick second. And we're going to define atonement with our slide. Atonement. Sometimes it's described by preachers as being at one mint. That's not really what it means because that's just kind of a play on the English transliteration, at one mint. But it's an apt uh, understanding of what's really happening. So an atonement is a reconciliation between two parties. A party that has been offended, a party that has been wronged, a party that has been sinned against, and the guilty people, the guilty party. And it's done by the work of a mediator. A mediator comes in between the two parties and does a work of reconciliation to, be, uh, to make these two parties able to come together again. The classic example that every evangelist uses is, you know, we're all sinners, we're all guilty of breaking God's law, and we stand in the courtroom, and the judge says, Mike, you owe this infinitely large sum that you will never be able to pay. I sentence you now. And someone comes running into the courtroom and says, I will pay that debt. Okay? I have not paid the debt. I cannot pay the debt. A mediator, a third party, has come in to intervene for me. Okay, that is what an atonement essentially is. So we're going to, we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit more as we go. Stay with me. You guys can handle this. But understand that in the Yom Kippur sacrifice, there exists not only this propitiation element, this wrath being poured out on the one lamb that or the goat that dies, but there's also an element called expiation. Now, uh, you've heard this term, Miss Lee. Don't even give me that. You were there for the four weeks. You endured expiation is what we were talking about in verse 30 of Leviticus. You are being cleansed or washed, a purification through sacrifice. In this case, in the Yom Kippur, understand there are two goats. One goat receives wrath and death, that is propitiation. The other goat has the sins imputed, and then it is driven from the people. The sin is removed. The sin is cleansed. The people are purified in the sight of God. There is a dual aspect to atonement. It is not an accurate statement to simply say that Jesus takes away your sins. He does, but he also dies because of those sins. There is a dual aspect to his work on the cross. He dies because sin deserves death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. I don't have that scripture, so don't worry about looking for it. If sin is how you work, death is your check. Okay? That's the modern Mike colloquial translation of Romans 6.23. Right? Propitiation. And then there is an expiation. Yes, he does cleanse us of unrighteousness. He does purify his people. He does remove the guilt that our sin has incurred. But one thing... The believer you need to understand about the nature of the atonement is that when wrath was poured out on your behalf upon Jesus, it was the fullness of God's wrath. Okay? The fullness of all that is hell, 
the fullness of God's justice and judgment and righteous anger against sin was poured into the body of Jesus Christ. And he died a very real death because he was counted as being you. Okay? Remember, wages of sin is death. Also, in that moment of his body being racked with death and suffering, His blood was poured out. And it is through that perfect, sinless blood that our sins can be purged. Our sins can be cleansed. Like the scapegoat, they can be driven far from us. But what is important to remember, believer, is that there is no more wrath left for you your faith and your hope is in the finished work of Christ, if you look to Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, there is never, ever, ever going to be judgment for you on the part of God. Because it is in that atonement that you are transferred from being a a slave to sin to an adopted child. And there is no wrath and there is no judgment for the children of God. Propitiation and expiation, these two things serve to function as the grounds of the atonement, the grounds of reconciliation based upon the work of a mediator between sinful, wicked, guilty me and a holy, perfect, just God. And if we understand how this uh, kind of third-party triangle thing is working, I'm just left in the courtroom. I'm just the one who had the gavel slammed down and said, you deserve death. It is the mediator who comes in and says, I will pay. It is the mediator who comes in and says, Mike, you may go free. I am taking care of this. It is Christ as the high priest who not only offers the sacrifice to God, but is himself the sacrifice to God. He does all the work. We are saved by grace, yes, Through faith, yes. But we are saved ultimately because of Christ. You have no grounds to boast. We have nothing to bring except the empty hands that receive all that Christ has purchased for you. Christ's death on the cross cleanses of sin, pays the death penalty for those who believe, thus making a full, complete, actual, and effectual redemption. Had to make sure I get all those adjectives in because they all matter. Okay? Full, complete, actual, and effectual redemption. Justice is satisfied. Sin is dealt with. And the prisoners are set free. When John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away sin, they knew exactly what he meant. And they had no problem with that statement. Until the word cosmos. Now we got a problem, John. Go back to Exodus 12. No foreigner shall eat of that lamb. Go back to Leviticus 16. This day of atonement is for the congregation of Israel. Yes. The type, the shadow, the symbol, that was for an ethnic group of people. The real sacrifice, the true sacrifice, the thing that the type points to, it is for the peoples of the world. Okay? That is why in Revelation 5, 9, it says, you have redeemed, you have ransomed people from every, every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. It is a cosmic atonement. Cosmos, cosmic. That's where our language gets the words. Big atonement. This was not pleasant news to John's audience. This was confusing news the entire time for three years that Jesus preached this. But it was the good news for those who hear and believe. It was the good news for those that were coming to John to be baptized. 
It was the good news for the woman at the well in John chapter 4, I believe it's verse 42, when she goes back to Samaria, which were like less than dirt, right? And they believe in Christ. And they say, not only because of your testimony, but we believe He is salvation for the world, for us, even us who are Samaritans. This was groundbreaking news. And again, I have no illustration to adequately like, compare the two. If you can come up with one, please tell me, because I'd like to have an actual illustration. But in our day and age, I don't know if there is one. So we've broken down sacrificial language. John takes these festivals and these high holy days, and he uses the, the intricate language of that to make a point. And hopefully we've scratched the surface enough of an atonement, and as we go on a little bit more, you'll get this clear, that the atonement is because of Christ as the high priest, as the mediator, bringing two parties together. It's through his death, propitiation, and through his blood, cleansing or expiation, makes the sinner able to come before God. And those actually are the two elements that tie in with our elements for the Lord's table today. When we take the bread, we're celebrating that broken body, that propitiation. And when we take of the grape juice, in this case, uh, that is rep representing the cleansing or expiating blood. They're both involved in this act. But let's break down the atonement as far as the grounds of our assurance. What this means for me and you. And again, as we're going into this realm, we need to understand when we talk about he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, that phrase can be misunderstood. There are three ways that we can understand that phrase, and we're going to break these down here. The first one is when John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we're talking about a universal atonement. He is the Lamb of God that takes away, removes the sin of the world, Every person is getting saved. A universal atonement. Okay? The second option is a potential atonement. When John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus has done all that is necessary for the entire world to come to him and be saved. All that the individual must do is believe in that and receive it. Potentially, no one could do it. Potentially, everyone could do it. Potential atonement. The third option is a definite atonement. That when John says, Behold the Lamb of, the God, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he is referencing that Jesus, the perfect Lamb, will come in to perfectly redeem and atone for people from every nation in the world whom God calls and draws and cleanses. Those are our three options. And logically speaking, there are only three options. Universal atonement, every single person has this atonement applied to them and satisfied in Christ, and every single person is getting saved. Good golly, I wish that was the case. It would make the Christian message a heck of a lot less offensive. It would also make the Christian message contradictory <laughs> and perfectly unnecessary. Why do I have to evangelize? Why do I have to have those uncomfortable conversations with friends and family members? Why do I have to tell people to repent of sin? Now, what's interesting about the universal uh, atonement option is they get the atonement right. The idea of the actual accomplished removal of sin and satisfaction of justice. They get that right. They just get the application wrong. Because Jesus himself says over and over and over again that there will be those who are in outer darkness and a wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a judgment for those who do not believe. As much as I wish that that message was true, because it would be easy and not offensive, and again, big surprise, I don't like being offensive, even though I am sometimes offensive, it is not the truth of the scriptures. The second option, the potential atonement, gets elements of the atonement wrong, to be perfectly honest. Because here's the thing. If Christ makes an atonement and removes wrath, and remove sin for every person, but then all you have to do is believe that, and it's yours, ultimately, who is responsible for salvation? The person. The individual. Which runs counter 
to all the teaching of Scripture in that Isaiah 48 says, God speaking, I will not share my glory with another. Nobody. So when God does something, he does it for his glory. And he's not going to share that glory with anyone. No other gods, no other people, no one. He exists to glorify himself because he alone is worthy of that glory. So when we have the notion that Jesus has cleansed everybody, you just got to believe it. What we're saying is ultimately, I am the instrumental cause. I am the reason I am saved and my brother is not. I am the reason that my sister, I don't have sisters, so just generic siblings here. I am the instrumental reason because I believe. But ultimately, the reason I'm saved is because of me. And this runs counter to every testament of Paul that he writes in the New Testament where he says, it is of grace, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If I can look to myself at all, it is not of grace. It is of me. Which brings us to the last option. A definite atonement. A definite atonement says that Jesus comes as the Passover, as the Day of Atonement sacrifice, the Yom Kippur sacrifice, he actually accomplishes this atonement. He actually takes wrath. He actually cleanses of sin for all who will believe. Out of all the nations of the world, every tribe, every nation, every people, every tongue, they are actually saved, not through their effort, not through their uh, uh, finishing of it, not through anything but his sacrifice alone. Who gets the glory? Jesus does. Who is instrumental in your salvation? Jesus. Which one takes all the boasting away from you and is faithful to the biblical message? A definite atonement, an accomplished redemption. And that now word I've mentioned about six times, redemption, is why this matters for you. So on the cross, Jesus uttered his last words, It is finished. To tell us die. And we're like, yeah, it's finished, right? Well, to tell us die is an economic word. It means a receipt. It means I have purchased. It means I have bought. Here is the receipt. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. I leave the marketplace with my possession that I purchased. To tell us die is my receipt. When Jesus refers to him being, himself being a ransom, when he talks about how he has redeemed people, this language comes from the ancient slave market. It is the, the, the payment that is made to purchase another person or to purchase a prisoner, because sometimes you could purchase prisoners as slaves. Now again, don't get hung up on the slavery thing, because that's not what we're trying to go at right now. What we're trying to understand is when he says, it is finished, I have purchased, he owns you. He owns you now. And you are his. Now, unlike human slavery, Jesus does not purchase people to abuse them. He does not purchase people to use them. He purchases people for his redeemed glory. So when he purchases someone at the cross, at the act of his death, he adopts that person into his family by his death. Although technically I guess the father adopts because the trinity different functions. Bear with me, be gracious please. Through the son's payment, the father adopts those who have been purchased. And when you are in the family of God, there's no way out of the family of God. When you've been purchased, it is finished. When you are his, you have no fear of ever not being his. When he has purchased you, he knew exactly what he was purchasing. He knew every sin you would commit, and he purchased you anyway. He knew every blasphemy you would utter, and he purchased you anyway. He knew how unlovely you were, and he purchased you. Anyway, believer, rest in the unchanging love of your Father who has actually and definitely and effectually purchased your freedom and brought you into his family. That is 
the doctrine of the atonement. That is what John means when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He did it. It is finished. And we may rest in that. John Murray. John Murray in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, writes, What does redemption mean? It does not mean redeemability, that we are placed into a redeemable position. It means that Christ purchased and procured redemption. This is the triumphant note of the New Testament whenever it plays on the redemptive chord. How can we say Christ is the victorious one? How can we say Christ has conquered? How can we say Christ is the Savior unless He actually does it? And if He actually does it, believer, all that we have is to offer our praise to Him. And we believe Him. Yes. We repent. Yes. I'm not trying to take anything away from all of those, those important concepts of what is your, reg- your obligation and your responsibility in light of the good news that a Savior has actually saved people. Of course you believe. Of course you repent of your sin. Of course you trust in Jesus. But what are you trusting Him in for? Trusting Him for? Are you trusting Him that He made it? potentially possible for you to do something? Or are you trusting that he did it? And all I do is praise him for it and rest in that. See, here's the thing. One more note on this, and we'll land this ship, and then you guys can go self-medicate with hot chocolate, and I'll talk to you if you have questions or problems about whatever I said. Here's the thing. Go back to the courtroom scene with me. Go back to the guilty verdict that was placed upon you. You wrecked your neighbor's really, really expensive car. I mean, you just plowed your car right into that. Maybe it was malicious and willful. Maybe it was an accident. Only God can tell, you know. But you owe a lot of money, okay? You can say you're sorry all you want. It will not take the obligation of debt. You can be genuinely sorry and repentant. You can be on your knees saying, I wish I never did this. It doesn't pay a dime to the wronged party. Okay? Repentance is your necessary response. Yes, your repentance does not pay for your sin. Jesus pays for sin. Your repentance merely shows your own brokenness and sorrow over your sin. Over the thing that killed the Son of God. So yes, repentance, I love it. Yes, repentance, we preach it. But your repentance is ineffectual to pay the debt that you owe. Only the blood of the Son of God the perfect, spotless lamb slain from before the foundations of the world, only that pays for, covers, and cleanses for sin. It is the atonement which guarantees that you, believer, have no more wrath ever for you. No more fear of hell. No more fear of judgment. It is the atonement that secures for us the removal of guilt for sin, and one day that very sin nature will be expiated away from me. And I will be forever in the presence of my Lord, in perfect peace and in perfect harmony. It is in the atonement that we are ransomed, purchased out of slavery to sin, and adopted unchangingly into the family of God. The atonement is everything for the Christian. Now the question here that I am obligated to now ask before we take of the table is do you believe that? Do you trust that? Do you rest in that work 
2,000 years ago on a hunk of wood on a hill in Jerusalem? Do you trust that the man who claimed to be God, who went and died and shed his blood and was broken and bleeding, saying that he was the only way to the Father, do you rest in that? Or are you still looking to something you're bringing to the table? Are you still trusting in something that you're doing, something that you did, something that you're going to do for God next time? I won't, I won't do it anymore, Lord. I promise. Your promise means nothing to God because only the blood of Christ can actually atone for sin. Now, as we transition to taking of the table, this is a time for believers if you are not yet to that place where you believe in and rest in and trust in Christ for your personal sin debt, please, I would ask you to refrain from this. Pray to God. Seek Him. If you're confused about anything, talk to me. I don't yell in your face unless I have a microphone on. So I take it off. You're good. You're safe. <laughs> but if you call upon the name of Christ as your ransom price that was paid for your sin, Take of this table and celebrate with your family. Christ invites whosoever will believe to come and take of him. Whosoever believes, come and take of this table today. We're going to read a different passage today than we normally read. We're going to read out of Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read. I'm going to do a minute of explanation. And then I'm going to invite you guys to stand up, masks on, please come and take of your elements, go back to your seat. Don't take them until we take them together, because we are a family. You don't eat before everyone else, okay? But remember, about these cups, you have to take the top part off first, with the wafer in it, and then open the juice. You've got to fiddle with it, you'll get it, okay? There are gluten-free One's in the little packets if you need that. Otherwise, uh, we only have the grape juice currently in these self-serve containers. So let me please read from Titus. We'll talk about the sacrifice, and then we'll celebrate that sacrifice together. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works." There's a couple reasons I picked this passage. But Paul here instrumentally lays down the concept of redemption. That the grace of God, not your effort, the grace of God, not your goodness, the grace of God, not your repentance, the grace of God brings salvation. He brings salvation to the unworthy. He brings salvation to the undeserving. And he does it not to make you awesome. He does it to glorify himself by transforming these people who once hated him into people who love him. To take those who were self-obsessed and sin-focused and wanted only death and make them people who are zealous for good works who walk in uprightness, who are godly. We come as a broken people to take of this table. We do not come as people who are proud of our efforts. Only those who are repentant have a place at this table. So as we prepare to take of this, the mindset that we come with is one of humble receiving. We did not earn this. We did not deserve this. But God is gracious gives this. So I'm going to invite you now to come. Come forward. Take of the elements. Return to your seat and we will take them together. Wonderful. You guys can go ahead and start any time. Yes, the, the tent is blowing away, but it's okay. Let's just sing together. 
Your blood speaks better word than all the empty things I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me. Stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your blood speaks better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Sing what can wash. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow, welcomed as the friend of God? Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. hold in our hands two elements, bread and the fruit of the vine. These elements are elements. They're things. They're signs that point to a greater thing. And that greater thing is the work of Christ. Like I said earlier, we take of the bread representing his body that was pierced, scourged, beaten, broken, and ultimately killed by God that his in his, his anger against sin, our sin, my sin, your sin, would be satisfied. Together, the bread of life. And as that body was being broken, the blood of Christ was poured out. The blood of the God-man, truly God, truly man, one drop would have been sufficient to obtain salvation. Yet he pours out as the perfect sacrifice every drop of his blood so that when he is pierced by the soldier's spear, it is separated between blood and water. It is only through the blood of Christ that we can have our sin removed and cleansed. It is only through the blood of Christ that we may become before a holy God. Yes, it was the will of the Father to crush his Son, but it was also the will of the Son to go and pour out his blood. Together, believers, take of the blood of Christ, the blood of the new covenant. Heavenly Father, I know that there is tension that we live in and that you would desire to crush your only son on the behalf of your enemies and that the son would willingly go and while we were yet enemies, die in our place. Father, we do not have to resolve that tension, but I pray that we would see the fullness of your attributes, love, justice, goodness, holiness, all on display at the cross of Jesus Christ. And it is Christ crucified, Christ dead, Christ buried, and Christ risen that is the gospel hope. We call it gospel because it is good news, and it is truly good because Christ has accomplished it all. There is nothing missing, nothing that needs to be added. It is truly finished. Father, I pray that your people would rest in the hope of Christ, rest in the hope of his satisfactory death, 
rest in the hope that he invites us to take of the table today with him in assurance that he will come back for his people. The truth is that we are never far from you, God, because you will never leave us nor forsake us. And you have given us your spirit as a promise of that. We just give you all the glory and honor for the plan of redemption that no man could come up with. It is all for you, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, the, our trash cans on the doors that way, please deposit your uh, communion receptacles in there. And then go down the hallway that my wife is walking towards right there. We will have beverages available. Thanks and God bless.